anybody that joins, I'll let them in as we progress um, through this meeting. So um, thank you all again for joining us tonight. Um, we're happy to be here to um, go over the, the improvements anticipated for Valley Parkway. Um, I'm Christina Lane. I'm the transportation planner here at Jefferson County. I have with me Kelly Dunn. She is our traffic operations and planning manager and also a traffic engineer for the county. And then I also have Steve Dorian, who is our transportation and engineering director, um, and they will both be here to support me in some of the questions that you guys might have along the way. Um, as I said, this meeting is being recorded, so um, for anybody in your community that may be interested in this that is not able to attend today, they can view this at a later time. I'm going to start with some uh, meeting basics. Um, so as I mentioned, this meeting will be recorded. I'm going to begin with a short presentation and then we will follow the presentation with a Q&A session. Um, until the Q&A session, I ask that everybody please mute your microphone so that there's no disturbances and everybody can hear the presentation clearly. After the presentation, uh, we encourage you to speak up. Um, this virtual environment has made it easy for us to get outside of the, the kind of loops of conversing with one another. So we really encourage everybody to speak up, use your voice and participate directly. And then also during that Q&A session, um, please consider turning on your camera. It's nice to be able to put a, a face to the name during these processes that have that have been virtual for the last couple of years. So let's head into it. Um, I'll start by providing everybody with a little bit of background. Um, so this process initiated about a year and a half ago when we began receiving some uh, concerns from residents through our citizen concern software where people had consistent requests to do something about the lack of compliance at the stop signs um, on Valley Parkway at both White Oak and Mount Laurel. So the corridor was actually slated for uh, anticipated for repaving in 2021, but due to the number of concerns we began receiving, we use this as an opportunity to conduct a public engagement process and ensure we were um, receiving all the potential community concerns and take a really holistic approach at this corridor instead of kind of piecemealing, which is what the general approach might be when we get random requests. So because this was a larger project, we really found an opportunity here to push it back a year. So we initiated our first public engagement meeting on July 15th, 2021. At that time, we presented an interactive engagement map um, and that allowed residents in the community to basically place points along the corridor, highlighting what their concern might be, whether it be speeding, lack of compliance with the stop signs, bicycle related, pedestrian related, et cetera. And in that process, we received 38 individual comments on the interactive map. Those common themes that we heard were just that, the stop sign compliance, we had some concerns over pedestrian crossings and requests for rectangular rapid flashing beacons, which are those um, pedestrian activated flashing lights that you see um, throughout the county in various locations. And then we also received some concerns regarding speeding. So at that point, the county, um, once the, the public engagement map closed on August 15th, the county began collecting data. And we collected data on, we conducted speed studies, volume studies, and uh, counted pedestrian crossings. And then at a secondary meeting, we provided, I mean, we presented those findings to the community. So it's first important for us to notice, I know, you know, everybody's been hearing a lot about what an warranted stop sign is, what an unwarranted stop sign is. And I want to highlight the initial, the actual intent and purpose of stop control. And that is, so any stop control, whether it be a stop sign, a signal, um, the purpose of stopped control is to determine who has right of way at an intersection. Um, and how that's ultimately determined is predominantly their major legs. So in this, this instance, Valley Parkway, um, any approaching roadways that would be considered the minor legs are going to be stop controlled. The, the right of way is going to be provided to the major leg. Um, and like I said, in this instance, Valley Parkway. So when we begin looking at four leg intersections, um, in this instance, White Oak and Club and Mount Laurel Longspur, um, but really anywhere within the county where we come across four leg intersections, we do what's called, we conduct what's called a always stop warrant analysis. And what that always stop warrant and warrant analysis describes, and these are set out by federal standards, is it determines that the minor, it shows that the minor street volumes, in this case, um, White Oak and Mount Laurel, the approaches, the unit approaches, so that includes vehicles, bicycles, and pedestrians, must be at least 200 units per eight hours, I mean, per hour for a total of eight hours. 
So anytime throughout the day, you have to meet eight hours of 200 approaches on to the, ma to the major leg. Um, volumes on White Oak uh, only met that threshold during the peak hour and were not met at any other time throughout the throughout the 24 hour total. Um, so during the peak hour, which was from eight to nine, there were 222 total approaches, 190 of those being vehicles. Um, at Mount Laurel during the peak hour, there were only 68 approaches during the peak hour, 56 of those being uh, being motorists. The reason why we conduct these, these threshold analyses, these warrant analyses, is because there are unintended consequences um, that are associated when always stops are implemented when they are not warranted. Um, previously, not just here in Jefferson County, um, it's it was really used, always stops were used as a, as a misuse as a form of traffic calming. And we continue to highlight that that is not a form of traffic calming and this industry standard highlights that. The reason being is that when people come to an unwarranted stop, they may stop, they may not, um, but in between after that stop sign, they have a tendency to accelerate at a much faster pace, creating greater hazards. Um, another additional unintended consequences with this is again, that rolling and running of stop signs. So it really highlights the, the driver expectation here when motorists approach an intersection and they do not see, they become accustomed to the lack of cross traffic they begin running and rolling stop signs. Um, and this can result in crashes. So there were no um, crashes over the last 10 years of data that we have at Mount Laurel. Um, there were there are two that occurred in uh, at White Oak. Uh, the two crashes that occurred, one was back in December of 2015 in the middle of the day at 12.15 p.m. Uh, a motorist was turning from White Oak um, onto left onto Valley Parkway and was broadsided, which people commonly refer to as a T-bone. This is not a common crash type scene at an always stop and implies um, that a motorist may have run the stop sign and T-boned this motorist. We also have a pedestrian crash that occurred in March of 2019, again, in the middle of the day at 1.30 p.m. This pedestrian was crossing Valley Parkway and was hit by a motorist traveling southbound on Valley, on, I mean, uh, crossing Valley Parkway and was hit by a motorist traveling south on Valley Parkway. So. Again, the assumption can be made that this could have been somebody running or rolling the stop sign and hitting this pedestrian. So with all this information that we um, collected and the, the data that we found, we presented three design alternatives to the community and we ultimately provided uh, residents with a two week period to vote on the preferred alternatives. So there were three alternatives presented to the community. Alternative A is the no action uh, alternative. No changes, leave Valley Parkway as is. 47 people voted for that. Alternative B was to install bike lanes and maintain the always stops. Um, we had 49 people vote for that, so just a little bit more than alternative A. And then finally, we presented alternative C, which was highlighted as bike lanes implemented, stop signs replaced with raised crossings on Valley Parkway. And we had 82 residents vote for that, that alternative. So that was the route that we progressed with. Um, highlighting the reasons that, we've, that we ultimately, um, that in our initial meeting when we presented this to the community, and then our stance at the staff level is that removing the all the stop signs on Valley Parkway, it really aligns with those national standards as I meant, but it also aligns with driver expectation. Installing the raised crosswalks, um, and now we are going to be installing the rectangular rapid flashing beacon also at White Oak. Um, that's the pedestrian activated lights that I mentioned, flashing lights. Installing those in addition with the raised crosswalk, um, it really just improves pedestrian visibility um, and has shown to reduce crash potential significantly. And then that vertical deflection, um, by providing that raised crossing really prevents the excess of the excessive speeding that might be occurring through the intersection with people that are currently running the stop signs. And then lastly, um, installing the bicycle lanes to encourage slower speeds. So um, studies provided by FHWA, the Federal Highway, Administ Admin Highway Administrative uh, is organization, they are uh, they conduct studies and ultimately set the standards for roadway design elements across the nation. Um, and they have found that by reducing roadway lane width, there's approximately a 2.9% decrease in travel speed along a corridor. So by installing bicycle lanes on this corridor, we hope to bring down those speeds. So um, as I mentioned, we did collect speed data a while back 
And while the posted speed limit on the corridor is 35 miles per hour, um, the 85th percentile, depending on, we, we conducted speed studies at three different locations along the corridor. And depending on where you were on the corridor, those 85th percentiles resulted between 37 to 40 miles per hour. And the 85th percentile is really used as an industry standard, um, mostly to set speeds um, because how the, the industry looks at it at is if 85% or more people of motorists driving a corridor are perceiving the design of a roadway to be at a certain speed, then they'll travel at that speed. So um, it kind of aligns with that, you know, you can't rent a car until you've been driving for 10 years. Um, approximately 10 years in is when motorists become accustomed to the, the same designs that they see on roadways and associate those designs with the speed limit. And this is why when we get requests for just reducing a speed limit on a corridor, um, it simply doesn't work. You have to have design elemental changes to reduce uh, the speeds at which motorists travel. So with the bike lanes, knowing that this is a countermeasure to reduce um, to reduce speed limits, we hope to get that 85th percentile down a little bit. Um, and then in the future, we will collect data. Um, but further, you know, we've already heard from some residents in the neighborhood now that bicycle lanes are installed that what was once a nice bicycle corridor is even better. Um, and then just to kind of amp that up a little bit more, the uh, bicycle lanes are an identified countermeasure, safety countermeasure for um, all roadway users, regardless of mode that you are traveling by to reduce roadway crash potential. So there are significant benefits from even just implementing the bicycle lanes. With that, um, there are there is an educational component associated with rectangular rapid flashing beacons that we want to really highlight to the community, um, and it comes around to understanding crosswalk safety. So, rectangular rapid flashing beacons are not stop control; they are a warning sign. They highlight that the pedest that there is a presence of pedestrians and um, reinforce that yield that yield movement. Um, so as an educational component, it's just really important that pedestrians at this time continue to confirm that motors have come to a complete stop before entering the roadway. And this is especially important for children at the crossing at this rectangular rapid flashing beacon on White Oak. Um, if, if children, knowing that children in the morning hour and the peak hour are the predominant users of this crossing location, um, it's important that they don't press that button and assume that that means that traffic is going to stop. Um, we've also heard some concerns about the operations. So um, regular activation during school drop off and pickup can cause potentially some delays on Valley Parkway. Um, and then we've also heard for some concerns regarding buses entering White Oak from Valley Parkway, that there are concerns that they may not be able to make that turning movement efficiently. Um, so with that, uh, the one program that we continue to push on all of our communities that are adjacent to schools is a crossing guard program. It is uh, an extremely effective way. Jefferson County Public Schools has a wonderful program with all the resources necessary to begin such a program. And it would provide the opportunity for um, a, adult supervision to encourage students to cross at a single time and only activate that during when you know a certain number of students have accumulated at the crossing. Um, but they would also provide some better opportunity for those buses to cross. I will uh, make that turn. I will highlight that we have been in contact with the, the schools um, that may be affected by this change and have not heard any concerns from them. Um, we've also been in, in touch with their um, safety manager and again, have not heard any concerns from that end. So ultimately school bus stops change regularly. If they feel that their operations have, have become challenging, then they will generally reroute and say they became they begin coming southbound on Valley Parkway so that they can make that right turn movement into the corridor instead. So on that note, um, as I said, it would be a very brief informational session just trying to hash out some of the details. Um, I'll highlight that the raised crossings are anticipated to be installed by the end of November. At that time, the stop signs will be removed. And then, as I mentioned, we'll continue to collect data on the corridor, especially for those speed studies, to determine what that new 85th percentile is. Um, and then we'll provide that, that information to the community um, once it's collected. But we'll usually conduct it about six months after the fact so that people become accustomed to the new change um, and be get, get used to their more natural behaviors on the corridor. Um, on that note, Kelly, do you what did you want to supplement anything? 
I think you did a great job there covering it. Um, I do see we have a question in the chat from Tim. Um, thank you for submitting that, Tim. I think we're also asking if anyone could verbally say their question, so this could be a little more interactive. Um, but Christina, if you if you see that, if you want to respond to Tim's question there about um, FHWA saying how to make stop signs work better. Um, yes, so uh, Tim, I have not seen this study before. Um, and I, so I can't, I can't speak to the study specifically, but I will say that ultimately the same, the same federal highway administration is providing the guidance for what warrants to stop, um, an always stop. And, uh, these two intersections are far below that. And ultimately driver expectation will continue to proceed. Um, let me see who has their hands raised. Um, Danielle. Hi, Danielle. I'm the one that um, put the petition together to get the stop sign to be removed and stopped. Um, as you can see, um, three over almost 300 people signed the petition in 72 hours. Um, and I read or heard your numbers of people who voted. More people signed my petition to get you guys to not remove stop signs than actually voted. Um, that being said, the reason why I don't agree with you guys removing the stop signs is it's near a school and it's near a bus stop. And if somebody's running a stop sign, they're breaking the law. That's standard driver knowledge for cop when you're 16. I see people run stoplights all the time. Does that make a stoplight unwarranted? No. Those stop signs are there for a reason. You are required by law to stop. Removing those stop signs is potentially opening up a horrible situation near a school. Your, I don't know what it is, your study was done in July of 2021. Kids aren't in school in July. Kids are in school mid-August. So your study was conducted when kids weren't even in school. I think the people who signed the petition voiced their opinion saying, do not remove these stop signs. We do not we want, want them removed. Yes, we love the bike lanes, they're great. I'm a cyclist, I use them. But I'm also a parent and I don't wanna see a kid get hit. We've seen last year a horrible incident at a stoplight with a kid getting hit on a bike. No one wants to see that in the Valley. And as a former federal employee, I'm sorry, but federal studies, they're not gonna send some low level career employee to Ken Carroll Valley to do a study. Don't remove the stop signs. The citizens have spoke. They don't want them removed. We had almost 300 people sign this petition asking you not to remove these stop signs. If somebody is running the stop sign again, they're breaking the law. Maybe more enforcement is needed out here, but removing the stop signs is not the answer and the citizens here do not want it. So um, I will provide some more information. So uh, the counts for the study were not conducted in July. We began public engagement in July. The counts were conducted in October when school's in session. We always ensure that we're conducting counts when um, we have clear weather days, no adverse conditions that would um, affect the number of vehicles traveled on the corridor. Um, so our, our study was conducted during, uh, during the school year when traffic volumes are anticipated to be highest. Um, it's important to note that the lack of compliance is not the reason that warrants or unwarrants an intersection. It is those thresholds that must be met. So a signalized intersection, and Kelly can speak to this a little bit more, uh, maybe a little bit more clearly, but a signalized intersection is the exact same instance where thresholds and volumes must be met to warrant the the traffic control treatment. It has nothing to do with the, the amount of compliance. The challenge with the volumes on Valley Parkway when it comes to compliance 
is our sheriff's department is extremely uh, constrained with the amount of member of their traffic member teams that can be readily available and sitting at an intersection on Valley Parkway for an entire day to catch the the few people that are excessive speeding or the few people that may be running the stop sign isn't an efficient use of county resources. Um, Chris, I, do you mind if I jump in? That, this, my absolutely. name is Steve Durian and I'm the transportation and engineering director for the division. So I oversee uh, all of the traffic control in the county. Uh, I just want to kind of maybe touch on the bigger picture that uh, I think you pointed out in your question. Uh, you know, stop signs don't enforce themselves. Um, stop signs are only as effective as law enforcement that's the resources allowed to write tickets at that location. And there's not enough resources to, to try to enforce basically honest drivers who are doing their best to drive a road and might run a stop sign that's not warranted every once in a while. Stop signs are really guidance to try to give best advice to the built environment of a road. And let me finish, please, please let me finish. Uh, what we have found much more effective for, and what we heard from the petition, and we changed, you know, oftentimes I'll hear, you never listen to our community. Well, we listened to your community very loud and clear. What we heard was we're concerned about pedestrian crossing at this school and a much more effective uh, solution and a more eye-catching solution, one that's much more proven to be effective throughout the county is a re re reticular rapid flashing beacons or these flashing pedestrian activated signs. They really catch the eye. They get much better compliance and stop signs. And we agree with you, our number one goal is the safety of pedestrians and travelers on our roadway. And we are 100% with you that that should be the number one goal. And we have found that this is the best solution uh, in these cases. Then why wasn't that a consideration in the first round of voting? That wasn't even an option, really. Um, I, you, you're giving us no removal. You're giving us raised crosswalks. You're giving us bike lanes, but removing stop signs. I think a lot of people were confused about what was going on, hence why when word got out in the community that stop signs were going to be removed near bus stops and near the school, people started contacting your offices and setting up petitions to voice their opinion that they don't want the stop signs removed. Just because somebody runs a stop sign doesn't, again, make it unwarranted. I see people leaving the valley at 470 and 10 Carroll running stop signs because of the construction, that's breaking the law. That is common driver knowledge that you are taught when you get your driver's license. If you can't stop, that's, you're, you're negligent. You're, you are breaking the law. The stop sign is a federal sign. You are required to stop. And okay, why don't we move on? We've got some other questions. Maybe we should move on and let some other folks Chime in. Um, Lindsay, you have your hand raised. Hello, can you hear me? I'm borrowing my kids' headset. So it's we hopefully can. a little quieter. Okay, good. Um, so I apologize. Right now we are um, in the middle of um, Yom Kippur dinner, so there might be some um, cranky kids in the background. Um, <laughs> They just said, hey. Um, so I what my first question was, um, I know that there has been some information going around about the who is going to front the cost of the um, the raised crosswalks. And so I was just wondering if you could speak to that. The, yeah, absolutely. the rapid beacon beacons. Yes, yes. So um, there the county will be installing two raised crossings, and those are at the locations where there are existing unwarranted stop signs. So that's at Mount Laurel and White Oak. Um, due to the number of concerns that we received regarding the number of crossings at White Oak, we are enhancing that additionally with a rectangular rapid flashing beacon. Those two will be completed as part of our uh, our parkway of, of the Full Valley Parkway Improvements Project. Um, so we have been, I apologize, I don't know why this, yeah, this uh, actually came up. So this is, oh, I don't know why that stopped sharing. Um, regardless, we don't really need to look at that anyways. Um, so those two will be, uh, installed and funded by Jefferson County. 
Um, we presented to the HOA two additional locations where we felt raised crosswalks would make sense. Um, and that is near Bannon Gear Hart Park, where we had some additional crossings. Um, your the, the HOA trails team assisted us in collecting data um, on the number of pedestrians crossing at those locations. So uh, we presented that as an additional location. And then I'm having a hard time remembering off the top of my head. I think it might've been Mahonia, um, but there were two locations that we presented to the HOA that if they wanted to proceed with, that we would support them pursuing a construction and right of way permit um, and completing those additional two raised crosswalks. So we will be installing and fully funding the raised crosswalks at White Oak and at Mount Laurel. Okay. Um, and then, um, what was my other? Oh, so you had mentioned the um, turning left, the traffic that's going to be facing northbound on Valley Parkway and then turning left across the, um, the southbound traffic at White Oak, like the buses and all the people dropping off. And so I was just wondering if you could speak a little more to that in terms of like what the plan is or what the transportation manager was saying about that. So, yes, yeah, so we, the, how the always stop warrant analysis works is it does take into consideration those necessary gaps for people to proceed through the intersection in a safe and efficient manner. Mm -hmm. um, the main concern that was brought to us was specific to buses. And so, um, you know, as speaking with the school district and the school, um, the school principal's assistant, um, We've discussed that if, if it becomes an operational challenge for the buses and drop off, that they have the ability to reroute and head southbound on Valley Parkway. Um, we have not heard any concerns directly from the school district, though, regarding that, that movement. Okay. And um, so for the raised crosswalk, is there going to be one raised crosswalk at White Oak and Valley Parkway, or there'll be two kind of like on both sides of the road as if the, the sidewalk is continuing on both sides? Right. Great question. So um, at the White Oak intersection, the raised crossing will only be installed on the north end of the intersection. Um, the main reason being is that there's receiving pedestrian infrastructure on both sides. So it's a, it's the, the safest, most efficient way for us to ensure that pedestrians are getting from facility to facility. Um, and then at the Mount Laurel intersection, um, since the roadway kind of heads east-west at that point, it will be on the west side of the intersection. Okay. Um, and then the other thing I was just going to um, mention, and I don't know if you can pull up those questions that you asked in the survey of, of option A, B, and C. Um, one of the things that I felt kind of frustrated with in answering them is that it felt like I really liked, you know, one part of option A, but in order to vote for that, I had to also vote for something that I wasn't necessarily excited about. And so maybe instead of having like six options or kind of a la carte, um, it felt sort of like I had to make a choice on which one I wanted the most. Um, and so I think that that's worth understanding in terms of how your results were presented. Um, because I certainly felt that way. And I, I sent out a lot of information. Um, just full disclosure, my um, interest in this is that I've been doing um, the walking and wheeling for the past few weeks. So this is a really big, or weeks, months, and years. <laughs> Um, and so this has been something that's been really in, a big interest of mine. And so I would promote this to other people. And that was um, some of the feedback that I got from them too, is that they just didn't like that. It was sort of like you option a had two things in it. Um, and so they liked one thing, but they didn't like the other thing. Does that, am I making sense with that? Yeah, completely. And I, I um, respect that and appreciate that feedback tremendously. Um, you know, when we, when we curated the responses, it was, truly intended to be around what we knew we could implement um, mm -hmm. and what we are, um, are yeah, what, essentially what we are able and could implement at the time. Okay. Um, a lot of the, I know some of the, the requests that we did receive in association with that survey are um, outside of the scope of a standard um, operations and maintenance project. So, um, you know, we have, we have at the county, we have larger capital improvement projects, and then we have these, which we consider operations and maintenance. So it's very limited um, concrete work, and it's really kind of identified internally as, or even externally, as just an overlay project. We're repaving and restriping. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we're, we're limited in our ability of what we could offer, and really based off of, of what is industry best practices is what we presented. Got it. Okay. Um, I will... Um hop off and then if there's anything else I might I might jump back in again.
Right. Thank, Thank you, you for everybody. joining us during your dinner, by the way. That was very, <laughs> yeah. that was, that was great. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Lindsay. Uh, Nicole, your hand's up. Hi, sorry, you were on mute. Um, first, Nicole Martin, first, thanks so much for offering this um, venue to communicate with uh, your constituents and stakeholders in this. I find it very helpful. My main question is, what was the decisioning around eliminating or the apparent elimination of the turn lane at Valley Parkway and Mountain Laurel? Great question. So, um, and Kelly, maybe you can speak to this a little bit better because I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head for what is required. But again, uh, all of this comes around to thresholds needed to be met. Um, and the with turn uh, with left left lane left turn lane movements, um, the number of vehicles Wait. turning. So we did conduct. Hold on. Uh, oh, hold on. I'm I'm my question. I didn't specify. My bad. My question is with regard to it's a right turn lane from Valley Parkway onto Mountain Laurel coming in from the valley. Okay, great. Um, so I will I'll switch my response. <laughs> um, no, you're totally fine. So um, right turn lanes are actually um, the my assumption is that that was initially installed because the roadway was built so wide. Um, right turn lanes are actually not an operational benefit. Um, they do not improve level of service along a corridor. So um, left turn lanes alternatively do. So we maintained one left turn lane because it met the necessary thresholds to um, accommodate that. Um, but in those other locations where we where we removed right turn lanes, um, those are not seen as an operational benefit in terms of level of service, which is really highlighting um, delays on your roadway. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've given a lot of insightful information about uh, driver expectations and and how it, it develops over years in terms of drivers um, becoming you know aware of their surrounding environment. How does that factor in when you've eliminated a, a turn lane that has been there for more than two decades? How did you? How do you? Um, how does that comport with driver expectations? Because more than likely, I think in human nature, people are going to continue to utilize at, as if there was a right turn lane. So that's a great question. And I would have to do some more research on, um, and if Kelly or Steve, if you have some more insight on this, um, please help me out. But um, I have to do a little bit more research on how that might anticipate when we have changes in um, traffic control or um, within our roadway design, which we see throughout the county regularly. Um, you're likely seeing some things down in your neck of the woods with overlay projects where, um, again, buffer bicycle lanes are being installed, right turn lanes have been removed on Pierce um, and different corridors. Um, I don't under, I don't believe there are any significant changes with those types of things since the striping is clear. Um, Interestingly, in Colorado state law, um, it is required to make the right turn as close to the curb as possible. So you'll often notice that in some of our designs, we will dash our bike lanes on the approach to the intersection to highlight that merging movement. Um, right. But it is state law anyways to, to make that right turn as close to the curb as possible. So it's not unexpected to see people merging into the bike lane to make that movement. So are you suggesting that under state law, it would be legal for two cars to approach at that intersection side by side. If someone was progressing into the bike lane to make that right turn, yes. Um, it is not to be used as a acceleration or deceleration lane. It is just to make that right turning movement. You might see those merges occur. Um, so if that does happen, then it, it would be totally legal. Hmm. Um, yeah, so I mean, my concern is just based on observation and what I've seen is that people are continuing to use it as they have for a couple of decades. Is there any um, possibility that the county might reconsider the elimination? Um, at this time, no, there would be no reconsideration um, for us to go back and restripe. But as well, you know, the the 
because it doesn't help the corridor operationally and mm -hmm. creates a greater safety benefit for the rest of roadway users, especially our most vulnerable roadway users, um, our bicycles and pedestrians, um, we would not foresee changing that, that uh, design. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, looks like Tim has his hand up. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Um, so this is meeting number six, I believe, on this topic. And uh, at the first meeting, I went through our whole neighborhood. I described every single intersection we have. All you've done is blown us off and ignore us. You haven't answered any of our questions. Every single person says they don't want the stop signs removed. There was a 300 person petition that went to the county saying that. There was an 1100 person petition um, about the development in our neighborhood that was also ignored. There was another 300 person petition that was also ignored. Then 12 people got on a board meeting with the county commissioners and the county commissioners ignored the residents again. And it's just really, really, really a pattern of ignoring citizens ignoring our requests. My mom lives right by that intersection. My mom is 83 years old. Several people on, our, on her street are in their 80s and there are several, there's four people in their 90s. My mom walks that path every single day. That's how she gets her exercise. The dry, the sidewalk is all broken. It has sticks lying all over it. I've had to go out and sweep the street. I've had to sweep the sidewalk. I've called the county, I've asked them to fix curbs, I've asked them to fix things, and you don't respond at all. You don't care about citizens, you don't care about taxpayers, you don't care about parents, you don't care about children. We have numerous fatalities in our neighborhood and you just talk over us and you don't listen to us. You're just unbelievably out of touch with what's going on. People go through stop signs at 60 miles an hour, they blow three stop signs in a row, um, we had somebody that was trying to run over a bear recently, and they almost ran over children in, in the process. We have called the sheriff hundreds of times to ask them to do things. They just give us a list of excuses. They say they have no money. They say they have no staff. And it's really, really, really frustrating. We have a fatality right by Dakota Lodge, uh, Nicole. There's another one right over by Safeway. And then, of course, there's a little boy that was killed last year. And then you go out on, on 470, and there's a bunch of those signs on the road that show fatalities. You go over um, by Chatfield High School, there's another two or three signs over there of fatalities. Almost there every fatalities, single road. There are fatalities all over the world related to traffic. But what we're talking about here, Tim, are two specific intersections, as I understand it. Do you have any evidence of fatalities at those specific intersections? I'm talking about our whole neighborhood. We don't have a single white line at any stop sign that tells you to, where to stop. Uh, if you look at that case study I gave you, it says put in a bigger stop sign and put a stop ahead sign, and that improves it by 57%. How much does a stop sign cost? A couple hundred dollars, and then another sign that says stop ahead, that's $100. These are not expensive and difficult fixes. We're just mm -hmm. asking you to paint lines on the road. We're asking you to put in bigger stop signs. You know, I do not want my mother being run over. I really don't. I don't mm -hmm. want her neighbors being run it over. It does. It's just, I think the traffic engineers are focused on No, yeah, they don't care. Jeff yeah. Cole okay, does Tim, not Tim, care. Let me, let me just, let me just jump I'm in. Tim, we, do we definitely. Let me, let me finish, okay. please. I have gone to the building, the Jefferson County building, and I've tried to make an appointment with the county commissioners. They don't respond. I've called them on the phone, they don't respond. You send them an email, they don't respond. They just want more and more and more money from us and they do not give us the services that we pay for. And they don't respond, they don't care about our community. The other thing we have in our neighborhood is we are in a red zone for fire danger. If there's a fire, another fire, we've already had three fires since December in our neighborhood. Three can, wildfires. Can you give us a chance to respond, let me finish, please. Let me finish. I am not finished. Okay. If we have an emergency, then we have a short meeting here, and we have a lot of other people who you have. You obviously don't uh, care. You're just meetings. trying to cut me off. You, okay. don't, you don't want to answer my questions. You don't, you don't... Okay, Tim. Let me just say, let me respond to that. Uh, to to say that we don't care, you know, that's that's really unfair to our staff. You know, we certainly do care. We're here because we want to create the safest roads possible. You've listed many other issues here that we, 
in our traffic engineering group, we were really focused on these two intersections and that's what we're here to talk about tonight. So I really wanna see if anyone else has anything they would wanna say. Um, it looks like, uh, Katie, you have your hand up. So I just heard somebody say something about, do you have any proof of any fatalities at those intersections? That's the main thing that we're trying to avoid here. From somebody that lives literally across from the intersection and watches cars fly through the stop signs all the time, I, I, I you know, this is a huge issue for us. Um, we have kids that cross and go to the bus yeah. stop. And so what I'm hearing you guys say is that our our stop signs are unwarranted and i don't understand how anybody who doesn't sit here and watch what's going on at that intersection over and over on a daily basis can say they're unwarranted i understand your research shows different um but as a mother of two daughters and somebody who watches what happens i see how fast these cars go on valley parkway is it correct no but they do slow down at least for the stop signs they know it's there they know they're gonna have to slow down i apologize and and that's also the same thing at white oak those are the only two stopping sections on our raceway that is valley parkway so for you guys to say that is unwarranted i i just don't understand that i can see how the raised guys shh, shh, shh. i can see how the raised flashing lights will help but if cars that don't see those flashing lights or those flashing lights aren't going at that moment shh, 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 like stop sorry um they have no reason to stop they can get up to 60 to 80 miles. And these are blind intersections. We have deer there all the time, not to mention children. So to say that, hey, there hasn't been any proof of fatalities, that's exactly what we're trying to avoid. And we need to be heard loud and clear about that because we are the ones that live here on a daily basis. This is our life. This is our children. These are us walking our pets. This is our wildlife. Like we're just trying to, to keep our community the way it is. And we feel like the way your research is taking it away, it just doesn't make sense. There's no way that those stop signs are unwarranted. Last thing I'll say is when we're pulling out of Deer Creek, which is Longspur, right across from Mount Laurel, do we have to wait to see if a Oh, I think your kiddo just muted you. <laughs> Thanks, Blakely. <laughs> um, the last thing I'm sorry that I'm saying is, is you know, when we're coming out of, of Longspur uh, in Deer Creek, right across from Mountain Laurel, do we have to hope that nobody's flying around that blind corner? Because they know they don't have to stop so that we can pull out safely. There's a four way stop for a reason. And I think that this, this um, the crosswalk needs to be on the east side where the actual crosswalk is right now. That's where the bus picks up. That's where people are crossing currently. So I'm a bit confused on why you're choosing the west side to do those flashing lights uh, in the raised crosswalk. So um, yeah, so there are quite a few things that I can touch on. Um, first and foremost, I wanna really highlight that warrants are not associated with crashes. Um, warrants are strictly associated with volumes. And when those warrants aren't met, that's what's resulting in these, these inappropriate behaviors through the intersection where people are running the stop signs. So we, we do not look at the, we're not looking at proof of fatalities when we're implementing stop control. We're, we're strictly looking at the numbers of approaches because that sets driver expectation. Um, so when we see the, for us, you know, when we're, when we're looking at this, and I think that this is a great way to perceive it on, on everyone else's end as well, is pedestrians at a four-way stop and an always stop intersection are always anticipating motorist stop. We have a, ped a pedestrian injury here, a crash that occurred at White Oak, and based off of the directions of travel for the motorist and the pedestrian, it's likely because a motorist ran that stop sign and the pedestrian was anticipating that motorist stopped. That's the hazard we want to avoid. We want to avoid creating an expectation that is not normally uh, perceived by motorists. So when 
a pedestrian strips out into the into the intersection on Valley Parkway, seeing that there's stop signs, assuming motorists are stopping, and the lack of compliance is creating a greater hazard of people running that stop sign, your fatality and your crash potential increases with that unwarranted stop sign. This treatment, the vertical deflection, um, in line with all the signage that we include, so um, we can, you know, how the how the design will be is you'll have the raised crosswalk, you'll have the flashing lights on both ends when it's pedestrian activated, pointing down at the the intersection for where pedestrians are expected to be crossing. We have shark's teeth. There are those little triangles. Um, those are the yield lines. Those will be on the approach, highlighting with additional signage saying yield here to pedestrians. Further back, we'll have advanced warning sign signage stating pedestrian crossing ahead, speed bump, reduce your speed to 15 miles an hour to take that speed bump, um, that raised crosswalk. So there's all these other measures that are incorporated with the raised crosswalk to bring greater attention to that intersection. Um, and then again, that vertical deflection is really gonna be the thing that reduces the speed entering the intersection to reduce that opportunity where those that are running the stop sign and may be traveling at excessive speeds um, will not have the ability to do that with that de that vertical deflection moving forward. Okay, can so I that, come yeah, in that, as well? That was it. Yes, please, Kelly. Katie, thank you so much for sharing that experience. Um, you kind of articulated one of the bigger issues is though, um, I call it a false sense of security. That's the thing we're trying to get at here. If you're on the minor street and you see an all-way stop, and you're expecting a driver to stop, but it's a driver that's gonna roll because these stop signs have low compliance, that's where we have that crash potential. That's what we're trying to avoid. We're seeing all these people that are rolling that are going 60 miles an hour. We would rather have them know that they have the right of way so that the side streets know to look both ways and yield than to have someone go through the intersection and then get hit. So that's the safety concern that we have with maintaining these always stops. So one thing that Christina mentioned is that there is a, a speed bump before you come to that where you would have to yield for the pedestrian. Is that what I heard correctly? Is there one on the west side and the east side? Nope. No, so I'll clarify. So there will be signage stating that there's a speed. It's a speed bump sign that we have throughout the county. Um, oh, yeah. That signage will be placed in advance of the raised crosswalk with the 15 mile per hour advisory speed att um, attached to it. So it's a, it's advanced warning signage to let you know that a pedestrian crossing is coming up, that pedestrian crossing is raised and to slow your speed. OK, but there's nothing that actually makes anybody slow their speed. The speed, the raised crossing itself would be that vertical Slightly deflection that we're raised. using. It's um, it's aligns with our speed hump, um, our speed hump design that we have. It just has the flat top to accommodate um, ADA compliance for that pedestrian access. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, again, the last thing I'm sorry is is just the concern of of people the way they speed up Valley Parkway, past the North Ranch entrance, straight through Valley Parkway, around the corners, yeah. and they have nothing. And, and this isn't even just for people crossing. They have nothing that is going to make them slow their speed on, at any point on Valley Parkway. They can accelerate up that hill, go straight around. Is it against the law? Of course, yes, it is. But we've seen it happen, whether they're blowing through a stop sign or not. But most people know that a stop sign is coming. They at least slow down if they're gonna roll through the stop sign. Same thing on White Oak, and it just gives, and I understand the false sense of security, I absolutely do. And I'm not just talking about crossing the street, I'm talking about driving that fast on Valley Parkway in general it can be super dangerous. So we thought that, yeah. that at least yeah, they yeah, slow yeah. down for those yeah, two, yeah. they don't just blow through. Now they're just gonna blow through at whatever speed yeah. they're going. They, I would imagine they'd experience some pretty significant uh, car damage if they went 60 plus miles an hour through a speed through a rates crosswalk. But um, you know, and, and there's there's various additional treatments. You know, as I mentioned, the um, the HOA is entertaining potentially installing additional rates crossings at two locations, and you know, combined with the the bike lanes and everything else, these are countermeasures that have been proven to reduce um, reduce travel speeds. So. We're trying to hit this from a you know multiple prongs and and reduce those speeds and and improve um and and improve driver and other roadway user expectation um but yeah as i said you know the that vertical deflection through the intersections will will in fact reduce speeds uh traveling through the intersections and then you know as we continue to highlight the we're we're mostly concerned with motors that are running these stop signs or rolling these stop signs 
and vulnerable road users and motorists entering the roadway at the same intersections. Um, as I mentioned at White Oak, a broadside is pretty uncommon in the county for an all-way stop. So, um, and that's that's the result of people running a stop sign. So we're trying to reduce, we want to reduce the crash potential for these more severe crash types. Mm -hmm. um, and those occur when when these weren't when these stop signs are unwarranted. Um, so I do appreciate the, the opportunity yeah. to be heard. This is something that's very, very dear to our hearts and extremely important. Um, as this moves forward, obviously I told you we are right there. <laughs> we will be watching this and we will definitely be reporting back if there are issues. And I hope that this Please is don't. something that will be an ongoing concern and that you will be monitoring and checking, um, you know, as you guys move forward. Absolutely, Katie. Yeah, as I mentioned, we'll we'll reconduct um, speed studies too to see if see if it's resulting in how we how we hope that the speeds will reduce along the corridor. Okay. Thank you so much, Thank Katie. Um, it looks like Christy, we've got just so everyone's aware, we've got about seven minutes left um, for the time that we allotted. So um, we'll let Christy. Um, looks like you have your hand raised. Thank you. Um, I appreciate you all putting this together because there's been a lot of chit chat as you can tell through the neighborhood so it's nice to actually hear all of this for myself and, and i also appreciate the data that you presented at first um i guess my questions are it it sounded to me and, and perhaps i heard this incorrectly that this st because you were paving the road then you started to take a look at making these changes is that is that the order in which this happened so we began um, receiving citizen concerns prior to knowing that we were planning on overlaying the corridor. Um, the citizen re concerns that came to our team were regarding the lack of compliance with the stop signs. And then we ended up receiving a few regarding drainage issues that were ultimately pushed off to our road and bridge team. Um, so once we began receiving the concerns from citizens is when uh, when we knew that our road, when we knew Valley Parkway was slated for repaving in 2021, we pushed repaving back a year to get a more comprehensive look at what the, the community was experiencing on the corridor. Um, oftentimes when we get these types of requests for stop sign compliance or speeding or whatever the, the request may be, um, we'll kind of tackle it at, at one time. And, and so we kind of look at it as like a bit of a piecemeal approach. But since we were going to be overlaying the corridor, we could address as many concerns as we could within the scope of an operations and maintenance um, uh, project. Okay. Um, my other question is, uh, thinking about this more, I'm not sure why uh, I mean, I live at Mountain Laurel and I have a lot of concerns about that stop sign going away. T touching on what you talked about with these driver expectations. And I think one of the other people who spoke earlier touched on this too. I mean, those stop signs have been there. I've lived in this neighborhood for 10 years now that those stop signs have always been there. My son and my daughter started driving in this neighborhood. The stop signs have been there. Now you're saying we're gonna take them away. I think that's where we are going to have these expectations that the signs are there. <laughs> And now, you know, now they're not. And so cars are not going to be stopping when we're trying to pull out to go to high school at seven in the morning off of Mountain Laurel onto um, Valley Parkway. So I have I have I've heard what everybody else said and I agree with them. But my, my other question is, since that's what we're really doing, is why is it OK to have like a, a stop light there in front of the Bradford uh, Middle School, but yet White Oak doesn't even warrant uh, a stop sign um, that seems doesn't that doesn't seem to be the same treatment being applied in both places where there's a school crossing. So the crossing at Bradford Middle, um, I don't know the history behind the signal itself, but those are often used um, in school zones. So a school zone is determined. Um, really by the main roadway that the school takes access from. So the school zone for primary would be um, on White Oak itself, and that's where we've where we've delineated the school zone. Um, the crossing that's signalized at Bradford Middle School, that is in the school zone. So that's it's treated a little bit differently because it's within a school zone and the intersection at White Oak is not considered part of that school zone. Is that accurate, Kelly? 
Um, well, and those traffic signals are pedestrian signals. And I think, Chris, you were kind of talking about vehicle signals, which are for vehicles and pedestrians. Um, so pretty much every elementary school and some middle schools throughout the county does have these signalized pedestrian crossings. And usually they are adjacent to the school. It's the point where it's intended to funnel the majority of students that are crossing. So we usually only have one point and it's as close to the school as possible. And I will say that is a bit of an outdated technology. Um, modern pedestrian crossings don't even recommend using those signals anymore. Um, so that's not something that we would be interested in installing elsewhere in the county. RRFBs are a more common type of approach for pedestrian visibility. Okay, um, my last question is just, I mean, it sounds like all of this is very data driven, which I actually can appreciate. However, what does it hurt to just leave the stop signs there? <laughs> Uh, I mean, I realize we don't merit the the volume or what have you to to maintain the stop sign, but it does. Do you does your department in any way? Is it all just data driven? Everything's based off the data, and the reality, I guess, doesn't doesn't play into this at all. That's my last question. I'm a little uncertain about how to respond to the reality well, let me, aspect. Let me, let me let me take a shot let me take a shot then. Go for so it, what we what we do is we kind of look at the problem first where it's a, you know what is the problem that's being reported one non-compliance to stop signs two pedestrian safety concerns we heard a lot of speeding concerns people blowing through stop signs and so when we look at that world of problems that we have to solve yes the data guides us to those solutions but we're really focused on the problems and the problems are non-compliant stop signs and concerns about pedestrian safety primarily. And so the RRFBs are a great solution for the pedestrian safety aspects and the stop signs being misleading is, is really at the heart of the problem of non-compliance. So we really start with the problem, we look at the solution, data certainly guides us uh, to those solutions, but it's not totally dri driven by the data. It's, it's really the, what is the problem we're trying to solve. Okay, well, we've we got a couple just, more questions. Um, yeah, we're just wrapping up, but we'll take these last couple of questions. Yeah. Um, it looks like Lindsay, you have your hand up. Trying to unmute and un whatever <laughs> as fast as I can. Um, so I I think she asked my one question in terms of what's the harm in just leaving the stop signs. Um, but my other question was, um, what was the logic or has it been considered installing a school zone around White Oak and Valley Parkway? I know it's not super close to the school, but it really is the funnel for the school and for, for South, Bradford South, which is like the elementary. Um, and I just was wondering if that was considered and, and kind of your thoughts around that. Um, we did not look at expanding the uh, school zone in this project. Um, if we ended up receiving a lot of support from the school where they stated that they would like to see that, um, then I think at that point we would entertain it. But because we haven't received any concerns from the school district, um, we we never even considered it. Okay. All right. That sounds like something I can work on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, Val. Let me unmute myself. I had two questions and years ago, about 12 years ago, I was in charge of the crossing guard program there at uh, Bradford. And um, what was what was the status of that? That's in the school's court now again to restart that program. So the crossing guard program um, can really be initiated by anybody that's interested. Jefferson County Public Schools just has all the resources to assist. So um, oftentimes they're initiated by parents in a neighborhood. Um, sometimes they're initiated by um, by staff at the school. Um, so it really depends on on who's interested. But ultimately, anybody can initiate the process for a school crossing guard program and lead that. Jefferson County Public Schools just has all the resources to assist. Right. So, but did you say that it was in process right now? Did somebody start that process or? No, no, no. I was stating that that's something that we highly encourage, especially for when, when we're installing this rectangular rapid flashing beacon at the intersection of White Oak um, and the, the concerns over the number of pedestrians cross students crossing at that location. Um, you know, we highlight the, the program as being one of the safest and most effective ways to ensure safe crossing just because there's adult supervision. Um, and that's that's very needed when we're dealing with elementary school students. 
Okay. Well, I'll try to, you know, participate if that comes up again, because, you know, we had issues both ways on that. And my, my second question was the crossing near Woodruff that isn't striped, it's it's signed right now. Now, it, it, I've been told that that's an area that does not warrant striping. There's a trail that crosses as you're coming up to the Bradford Intermediate area to the north of Woodruff. And is that my understanding correct that that doesn't warrant a, a crosswalk there? Um, for the intersection at Woodruff, um, we would generally not install a crossing there since we do have the signalized crossing um, at the entrance this is of Bradford. Just a to the north of it, where there's a trail crossing, and there's and there's signage. You know the rectangular arm signs are not flashing. And there's a you know a cut curve on both sides of that. I was wondering, was was that? Oh, I see. Addressed? On the on Woodruff, you're saying. Well, well, no, just to the north of Woodruff on Valley Parkway. Let's see if I can find. There's a trip crossing. You know, maybe. Oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes, yes, so yes. Um, so. In our discussions with the HOA, um, there's a bit of a challenge, and this is actually one of the locations that the HOA is considering installing a rectangular, I mean, not a rectangular rapid flashing beacon, a raised crossing. Um, yeah. We at the county are unwilling to install enhancements to the crossings that service just Ken Carroll HOA's private trail system. Um, so because these don't service, because Ken Carroll HOA is a, a unique um, homeowners association where the trails within the community have been privatized. They're not available for public use. Most developments throughout the county um, have public easements on all their trail systems. And so we're happy to in, in, install enhancements when warranted at those locations. Um, so in our conversations with the HOA, um, we've said that we would be happy to allow them to pursue a right of a construction right of way permit. Um, I've noticed there have been a couple comments about uh, HOAs don't maintain roads. Completely accurate. Um, we allow external agencies to construct in our right of way after pursuing a right of way in a construction right of way permit. And we have offered that to the HOA. So if they would like to see a raised crossing be installed here, that is 100% an option that the county would be supportive of, um, but that would need to be installed and funded by the HOA itself. Um, again, strictly because okay. it's they don't service the public. So. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then we'll take this last question with their hand raised. Um, I cannot reference a name. I just see guest. So if anybody else still has their hand raised that's just signed in as guest, we are happy to take your question. Hi, I don't know why it shows up as guest. I'm using <laughs> one of my kids' computers, so it must be a school thing. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to echo the concerns of Christy and Nicole that that intersection at Valley Parkway and Mountain Laurel, where we used to have a straight through lane and a right turn lane. Um, now that the stop signs are being removed, there's no turn lane. And you mentioned that typically you have the cars go as close to the curb as they can, but the bike lane actually pulls out in towards the Valley Parkway at that point, And there's not a dashed line there as there is at the turnoff for North Ranch. And, you know, I don't know what your numbers say, but there's a considerable amount of traffic that goes up to the manor house at that point. Um, and then also the residential traffic that is one of the, um, I don't know what the term is when you plow the roads, but that's a road that gets plowed. It's a primary road or secondary road or something, but to consider putting in a dashed lane there to warn the bikers that people are gonna be taking that right hand turn north or whatever onto Mountain Laurel Parkway. Um, <clears throat> I've already experienced driving up through that. The stop sign is still there. You stop and you slow. And as you go to turn right, a biker blows through on your right hand shoulder. You're not looking over your shoulder. Something to alleviate that crash potential and to, you know, more delineate to the bikers. Hey, people are going to turn right here. I think that's a um, big safety issue for that one. Um, as far as the choices that we were given when you initially provided the survey, there were basically the three choices that we were forced into choosing from. Um, I was curious how many people responded to one, something other than those three choices, because I know I replied that keep the stop signs and no bike lanes. 
Um, a lot of people do like the bike lanes, a countermeasure to reduce the speeds, but I think it's also introducing just another issue for traffic on the roads of watching for pedestrians, watching for bikers, um, that the, the bike lanes are kind of going to maybe create more crashes. Um, but just that the three choices that you initially provided to the citizens are not necessarily ones that everyone is liking. Currently, no one wants the stop signs removed. And so we're asking that you, you know, it's data driven, but if you live here, then you understand how the cars go blowing through the stop signs. It's a safety concern. There's a lot of little kids out there, a lot of wildlife here. So um, don't look at just the numbers, but listen to those of us that are gonna have to list to live with this, that we don't want the stop signs removed, that I do like your raised crosswalk ideas, but you know, th there's got to be some sort of a fine line compromise and not just tell us the numbers don't warrant it. So, yeah, as I mentioned previously, um, the, the alternatives that were presented to the community were what we are able to implement within a standard operations and maintenance project. Um, so the reasons that the raised crosswalks with stop signs were not presented is that is not a treatment recommended by federal guidelines. Um, I cannot think of a single instance where um, in all the research we've done on rectangular, I mean, on raised crosswalks, um, where a stop sign has been in conjunction with that treatment. And I haven't found anywhere that that is even a recommended treatment type. Um, so that was the reason that we didn't entertain that as an opportunity. Um, with those, we did receive some additional comments over with, with those that did vote for, um, that did vote for the raised crosswalks and removal of stop signs. Um, and, and again, those were, were kind of looked at as this is, we provided the alternatives that we were willing and able to implement. Okay. Um, we understand One that it's, it's unfortunate is, that it doesn't necessarily align with what the community um, um, feels may be the best approach. One further comment is that when you're talking about the buses that might have to make that left turn onto White Oak, um, that they the schools did not provide a comment and that they might be able to reroute um, I would suggest you call South Transportation for Jeffco schools because those buses serve as two schools and they go at the same time opposite directions. I don't know that they can actually reroute that but the way that you're describing simply because they drop off at one school and then they go over to the other school and drop off. Um, it's, it's just how they have to operate based on the number of kids and trying to maximize the number of kids per bus, et cetera. Um, I don't think that they could reroute. Yes, and you know, unless we hear from the school directly on on their initial concerns with operations, um, you know, all of this is is really anecdotal. Um, and and there's potential re re potential solutions that the school district can come up with as well. Um, but I will say that we do know that bus routes change annually, um, and and operations do change as right as often too. So. OK, well, but you might well, want me, to well, specifically well. point out to them because um, working with the county on the new developments that are going in, the new developer proposed a trail that went from the development parcel to Chatfield Senior High School. And Chatfield said, oh, you've got these parks and stuff. And basically they were being asked about how many kids can go to which schools and do you want this tract of land in lieu of fees? And nobody pointed out the fact that there is an unauthorized trail accessing their private property. And when that was pointed out to them, they requested that be removed. So I think that the South Transportation should be contacted and say, this is potentially what we're looking at. I wouldn't rely on the district to have eyes on every aspect of what's gonna occur um, because that's just simply not in their purview. This, that's, that's not their expertise. Thank you, I appreciate that feedback. We will. Um... We'll, we'll definitely consider reaching out to the South Transportation. Yeah, let me just uh, end tonight. I know we're a little bit over time. I really appreciate all of your time and all of your input. I know this is a tough decision for us. It's a tough, we've heard many different opinions from the community uh, and not everybody's gonna agree with everything that happens here. And I, uh, you know, that's, you know, that that's uh, I wish I could make everybody happy all the time, but that's part of the job is that we've got to make tough decisions that not everyone agrees with. I do want to promise you, though, we have been listening to you and we will take your opinions into consideration. I know some of you may not believe that, but we do take your uh, thoughts into consideration. The reason we're here tonight is to hear have we missed something or is there something that we need to consider more? And we will take the, your feedback 
uh, back to, and we will talk about it with uh, further among ourselves and with our road and bridge group before any final uh, installations are done. Um, but uh, I do want to say thank you very much for being here, and we will um, we will uh, discuss this further uh, among ourselves, and uh, and we'll see how we move forward. Thanks very much. All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you.